Tonight, a one-on-one -on -one feature interview with Tamara Leach, author of the best-selling book, Hold the Line, published by Rebel News. It's April 27th, and this is The Ezra Levant Show. Shame on you, you censorious bug. know the number one news story in Canada in 2022. It was the trucker convoy, a grassroots authentic uprising of ordinary Canadians, rather leaderless, certainly without funding. Crowdfunding attempts were seized or frozen or rebuffed by the government. But frankly, that only added to the mystique of the truckers, they were beholden to no one, no political party or super PAC behind them. They inspired the nation. They snapped us out of the false consciousness that everyone agreed with the way things were going. They, in the instant, uh, crystallized a civil liberties crisis when Justin Trudeau panicked and invoked the Emergencies Act. But in so doing, they succeeded by revealing Trudeau as the tyrant that he is and I think set the stage in the medium term for his downfall. I believe that when the history books are finally written, his greatest opponent won't have been Aaron O'Toole, Andrew Scheer, or Pierre Polyev, but rather the truckers. Now, I said the truckers were rather leaderless, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. Truckers by nature are independent-minded. They're people who spend a lot of time thinking about things as they drive in their trucks, but as the convoys converged in Ottawa, a handful of voices became known as, if not the uh, organizational leaders, at least the spiritual leaders of the convoy. And I think by far the woman with the most following and who best reflected the goals of the convoy was Tamara Leach. As you know, Tamara was arrested held in prison for a month and a half on an incitement to mischief charge. She was persecuted by a zealous prosecutor known for his hefty donations to the Liberal Party, and yet she maintained her composure and good faith the whole time. She was slapped with bail conditions that made it so she couldn't speak candidly, couldn't even travel with, into certain places without her lawyers. But I'm delighted to say that in one of the greatest achievements that Rebel News has had in our eight years, Tamara Leach has agreed to publish her memoirs, her autobiography, a book that's part history book and part inside story and all autobiographical about those momentous days and about who she herself is. The book is called Hold the Line. And it's her story from the heart of the trucker convoy. And she joins us now via Skype from her home in Medicine Hat. Tamara Leach, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. I've enjoyed getting to know you a little bit over the recent weeks. I am extremely excited that we are publishing your autobiography. And I couldn't be prouder that it hit number one on the Amazon.ca bestseller list in its very first day. Crazy. I, I, I'm still stunned, actually. I never anticipated it would take off that that quickly. So thank you and everybody at Rebel, too, for, for all your help. This has just been an amazing, amazing journey. Well, I, it's an excellent book. And I don't want to say that I'm surprised by that. I mean, I, I knew it would be excellent. I mean, you, you have a lot of thoughtful things to say. But it's genuinely, uh, th there's details in there that have never been written or published before. I think you you show your heart. You're you're kinder, I think, than many people would be, having been through what you've been through, and and I think your love for country is what shows through. And again, I think other people, having been through what you went through, would come out maybe sour or hostile or combative. I think you met hate with love. I I, I say that as you know, we we published the book. Obviously, we like it, but the book surprised me a little bit. Well, I, I'm not, I'm not a very angry person. Um, I don't think that that's how you solve problems is by getting angry and stomping your feet and being bitter. I always from day one maintain that we were going to Ottawa in peace. 
uh, we were just calling for love and unity and respecting the police officers. Uh, we just wanted to be heard. And, you know, sitting through the POEC and all the stuff that we've been through since, I come away with thinking with the same point of view that we did everything right. Mm -hmm. You know, we saw the risks involved and we mitigated them every at every turn. And uh, I'm proud. I'm very proud of the people that I've been fortunate enough to work with throughout this last year and a half, uh, we've become like family. I'm very grateful that I have an opportunity to share my story, what my experience was like in Ottawa and how, like my perspective. And I think people were curious about it. So I, I think they'll, I think it'll answer a lot of questions for a lot of people. Yeah, I, I think it will. And I think it is a kind of fact check, not just on the government, but on the regime media, I mean, let me give you one example. I, I mean, I only met you in recent months um, and I had heard that you were Métis. And I mean, in some ways that's irrelevant if you were black or white or whatever, it doesn't matter. You're a Canadian. But I know that in our current media culture, if someone is indigenous, that's a uh, an interesting plus that shows that they're part of a diverse movement and tolerant. And it like it's a it's a plus that you know journalists mention. And the only thing I read about your indigenous background was that it was in question. And you treat that in the book, and you say it's not in question. It's absolutely true. But the but even the Aboriginal People's TV Network, which should have cheered you on as a champion. It was almost like they knew their mission was to discredit you even on something as basic as your your ethnic identity. I reading your book was an enormous fact check. Almost everything I had read about you through the mainstream media turned out to be false. That's correct. I think that was one of the greatest things that we exposed in Ottawa was the fact that the narrative that was crafted, they, they were crafting. And as you saw, when the evidence came out at the POEC, that narrative was crafted before I even met Chris Barber in person. And that was January the 24th. So mm -hmm. they already had a whole narrative crafted. I think uh, the convoy exposed them for what they are. And I know speaking for myself and on behalf of a lot of the other organizers, we are so grateful to organizations like Rebel News and, um, True North and all the like Rupa Sabriana, uh, all, all the all the journalists that actually got off their butts and went down and talked to people and recognized immediately that what they were seeing on the ground was not what they were seeing on the news. And and that is uh, to your credit. Well, thank, thank you for that. I, but it's just astonishing because most I mean, listen, I'm proud of Rebel News and we covered the trucker convoy pretty, pretty uh, comprehensively. But most Canadians still get their news from traditional sources. The CBC is in decline, but it still is huge. And CTV and Global and the Toronto Star and Globe and Mail, they, they I, I got a question for you. Have you, and maybe the answer is yes, by the way, have you ever been interviewed on a CBC television program? Have you ever been invited, uh, you're, you no, you're shaking your head. No, you, you yeah, never. No, uh, not since then. I, I know I had emails from CTV's Glenn McGregor. Oh, well, he, uh, he's a, extremely hostile oh, he, to you. He's something else. But how he, about, okay, and I'm glad you special. mentioned that. So he, I mean, I think he was probably trying to trap you. But, you know, you're a newsmaker. And again, the fact that you're a woman is is interesting, but it's not the the story here it, it's it's a it's an interesting addition to the story and again if you were on the other side of the ideological uh, spectrum you would be look at this woman leader young uh, indigenous woman fighting the world like it it would be they would sing your praises you would be given honorary degrees at university you would be invited to to give a TED talk or something at U of T. Well, it, it checks all their boxes, yeah. you know. And and it, that's not the most, the most important thing is what you did. But I'm just thinking of how the media, if they covered you at all, came out to destroy you. Are you, sorry, let me just ask it clearly, because you said Glenn McGregor reached out to you once, and he's he's sort of a muckraking CTV reporter, who extremely partisan. But how about any of the, the talk shows? Like CBC has a panel called At Issue hosted by Rosemary Barton and, and or, or see, you know, there, there were some, 
There are some talk shows, Global has them, CTV has them, where they have newsmakers on and ask them questions. Were you ever invited on any of these panel shows? And maybe you were. I, I just don't know if you were. No, I haven't. Never With the once. exception of while I was in Ottawa, I, I was approached by a gentleman from the Fifth Estate. Okay. And I think uh, you probably saw that. I believe they had James Bowder and Pat King on their show. Uh, I declined right, right. <laughs> when they asked me because I wasn't obviously at that point. This was a week or two into the protest. Uh, actually, I think it was the day the Emergency Act was invoked. And I did that press conference with the Honorable Brian Peckford. And he approached me, this gentleman approached me from the Fifth Estate after that, and I just said, no, thank you. Yeah. And again, oh, the Fifth Estate, nothing. not really a panel show, then an investigative, they're basically a, a hit team to, to go. I, and I, So I appreciate you telling me that because I did ask, ha, did any reach out? But if the only, so, so you were never invited on a CBC panel, like they've got this news, this 24-hour news channel, and they have 24-hour radio. They, they've got a lot of different channels. No one ever said, hey, here's the woman at the heart of this thing. She's also an indigenous woman from the West uh, who's suddenly become this leader of this movement. Let's ask her some questions. Let's ask her some tough questions. Let's, let's ask her some really good questions. That never, never once. I think you're the newsmaker of the year. No. The truckers never. were surely the story of the year. They would rather write about you than talk to you because you might give answers they didn't want. Well, it wouldn't fit their narrative. Yeah. I find that incredible. I find that just incredible. And I mentioned the indigenous thing because, I mean, because I just know that if you were a Trudeau supporting indigenous woman, you, you would, the sky would be the limit. You'd probably be in the Senate right now. <laughs> you know, you yes. absolutely would. Well, that, that oh, just, they would be, they'd be parading me around Canada, giving me medals. And I mean, yeah. that's, that's the, that's the tragedy of, of this whole thing. I mean, I do check a lot of their boxes, but because I don't fall on the so same side of the spectrum politically as they do, I mean, they question, they question my heritage. They accused yeah. me basically of lying or at least insinuated that I was I lying. Know, that was crazy. And I, I mean, I'm not going to say I believe them, but boy, they kicked out such a fuss that even I myself, I, your book set me straight on that and, and on so many things. I don't think people know how much of a logistics organizer you were. I just didn't know. That you, I mean, to me, when I saw you, I saw you give these emotionally uh, encouraging Facebook videos along the way, sort of like a daily update. They almost felt like healing messages. I didn't know you're also a tough as nails logistics boss. I just didn't know that about you. Tell our viewers a little bit about like, where did you get this organizational skill from? Because not everyone can, it's like an air traffic controller or, you know, spinning plates. You got 20 things on the go. Uh, you know, I think an ordinary person would be overwhelmed, would get bogged down in emails, would forget about things. How did you stay on top of this army that was like assembling and asking you for guidance? Uh, yeah, it was pretty crazy. I, I got involved in logistics um, through the oil and gas industry, actually. And it was through working in the fracturing department that I, I, I discovered I was really good at it. And at that time, we didn't really have cell phones. So I had memorized all the employees' numbers, the managers' numbers, like all the service industries that we use, the sales guys in Ottawa. You know, I, I, I was organizing personnel and equipment and specific jobs. And so I... It was said I just I really love doing it and and uh, and I turned out to be good at it and it turns out I can multitask really well, so it it's a passion of mine. I I work really good under pressure. I I I found that I worked really well, you know, with deadlines, and um, I, I had a very successful logistics career in, in the oil and gas. And as you know, in Alberta, when it's booming, I, it was busy, <laughs> like really busy. Yeah. Well, and you would have, if you're dealing in the frack business, I mean, fracking, there's a lot of trucks, there's a lot of truckers, you know? And so the kind of people who like independent minded, slightly cowboy, you know, rambunctious, maybe uh, not too politically correct, maybe big guys like that's, you could call it a men's world. I, I, I think it's fair to say, but you fit right in and you weren't intimidated by the big lads. You were sort of the one bossing them around. You were again, what the left would call a girl boss. You just 
you'd always done that. And so you fit right in as a, really a logistics captain. I mean, I can only imagine you've got hundreds, even thousands of trucks. Okay, well, where are they going to get gas? Where are they going to get food? Where are they going to stop for the night for the ones who, who can't sleep in their cat or the ones who can't? Like, I, once you start thinking about these, where are you going to park? When you get to Ottawa, where are you going to go then? Like, those are real problems that need to be solved and solved quickly especially like a lot of that stuff had to be done kind of on the fly because we didn't know um, when we started how big this was going to grow. So when we pulled into Arnprior on the 28th of January, we were 100 kilometers long. Hmm. So, you know, there's the safety aspect, not mm -hmm. like keeping the truckers safe, but also, you know, keeping the, the, the supporters that were on the side of the road safe. I mean, they were coming right out onto the highway, tossing food in our windows, you know? So <laughs> there was a lot of aspects that occurred like in real time on the ground that, that we had to mitigate and risks and everything. And again, like, I can't say enough about the the, the people that I, I, I worked with here. I mean, they were just, they were all professional. You nailed it. Truckers are independent minded. They're very strong. They don't like being told what to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're just so resilient. And uh, in this case, heroes they're heroes yeah you know i think people trust truckers because I, I mean there's other professions that people have raised an eyebrow like lawyers journalists politicians you know the uh you know people joke about used car salesmen and and maybe that's unfair but no one looks no one thinks a trucker is trying to trick me they think the trucker's right. the guy working hard i'm tired i need to pull over uh, to get a night's sleep on the motel, that trucker still has miles to go before he sleeps. I, I'm i lonely. Well, yeah, well, that trucker is on the road for, you know, I mean, all because people know it's hard work. He's not slacking. You can't slack off as a trucker. you got to pay attention. And I don't know, I think people admire truckers. And so if the, there was a moral cle cleanliness to them, and people knew they were not, like, if you have a bunch of lawyers doing something, well, who's organized them? What are they being promised? Did the justice minister say, hey, I need your help, and if you help me, I'll appoint you to be a judge? Like, there's always some other story when a lawyer's doing something, but when a trucker's doing something, everyone took it at face value. I think it was so important. And by the way, you have 100 miles of truck. That is a bloody amazing sight to see. Let me ask you a question. What part of the country gave the most exciting Welcome, because by the time these trucks came to Toronto, I, I'm going to guess maybe a million Canadians firsthand saw the trucks. They were they were going over the 401. People were watching in busy Toronto. They wanted to see this phenomenon, and I think they wanted to see it with their own eyes because they knew the media was sort of telling you know porkies about it, and and they wanted to see. Is it real? And you see 20 miles of truck go by, you think, holy, it's real. I'm not the only one who's got some questions. I thought I was alone. Here's an endless convoy of truckers who says I'm not alone. And if that's what the truckers say, surely other people, like it was, I was amazed by how many people came out and watched. Where, give me an anecdote. Tell me a story of a place you went that you thought, whoa, this is really connecting. Absolutely, hands down, Manitoba. Hmm. When we got through Headingley, well, when we got to Headingley and all around the perimeter, way out to the other side, almost to the Ontario border, believe it or not, was thousands and thousands of supporters. And, you know, by this time already, we knew that we were growing and, and uh, you know, the momentum was really gr growing. But I, I, I mean, I've, I've said this before, but you know, we're driving down the highway and I look out the window and to my right is native dancers drumming in their full regalia, standing beside a group of young Sikh gentlemen who were standing beside Hutterite women uh, and children with holding signs and beside nuns in full habits, Catholic nuns. Like that is that was one of the most, most profound moments for me because I, I realized the unity that we were seeing that we hadn't seen in so long, you know, it didn't matter what color your skin was, what God you worshipped, how much money you earned in a year, which part of the country you were from, you were just a Canadian. Mm -hmm. And we were 
celebrating that again. And, and that's what it was. You know, the people on the roads were celebrating that hope again and yeah. being feeling proud of our country again. You know, there was it, it, after all the last few years, there's been so much division. It's been, you know, labels against labels constantly. And, and we just crushed it. Yeah. Canadians crushed it. This free episode of the Ezra Levant Show is brought to you by... Tamara Leach has been released from jail. Western separatist Tamara Leach. Leach will remain in custody. We have breaking news out of Ottawa to tell you about. A judge has made a decision on whether to grant bail for Tamara Leach, one of the leaders of that recent demonstration in Ottawa. You may have seen me on the news, but there's more to my story. In my new book, Hold the Line, I share the story of the Freedom Convoy from the heart of the Freedom Convoy. It's a story of hope, courage, and coming together as a community in the Canadian way. You can buy my new book at theconvoybook.com, and in that book, you're gonna hear stories from the heart of the convoy, as well as my arrest and my time in jail, like you've never heard them before. Until very recently, I've been quite silent because of my bail conditions, but now I'm ready to tell my story, my side of the story. I know the mainstream media isn't gonna be fair to me, as they've already called me and my friends from the convoy terrorists. There is increasing concern about violent online rhetoric supporting the convoy, and that those with extreme views are planning on attending. The mayor who uh, made, a, in my estimation, just a horrendous decision to negotiate with terrorists. So I'm launching a book tour across Canada. We'll be doing interviews, signing books, and saying thank you to all Canadians for your support. I've partnered with Rebel News to crowdfund for the cost of my book, as well as our advertising campaign. With your help, we'll be purchasing ads and billboards to spread the word about my book. We'll also be upgrading my home studio, which will enable me to do interviews all around the world. If you're a shop owner or a business owner and you'd like to have a book signing, please fill out the form on our website, which you can find here. And if you'd like to make a donation for the tour, we'll greatly appreciate it. The first 500 people to send in a donation of $200 or more will receive a free signed copy of my book, Hold the Line, My Story from the Heart of the Freedom Convoy. The last time I drove across Canada, something very special happened. Let's make that happen again. Go to theconvoybook.com. Thank you. You know, there was a feeling of love in the air. I, when I went to Ottawa, I was there only for a few days myself, but there was a festival feeling. It almost had like a Canada Day patriotic feeling. I'd, I, when I first arrived, people were driving in the streets like, you know, uh, an NHL almost like the Stanley Cup finals and your team won, like people were just whooping it up, driving around, cheering. Like uh, there was a feeling of harmony. And, uh, and I imagine in a way it would have felt a little bit like Woodstock would have felt, you know, 60 years ago. Um, you mentioned ethnic diversity. I, I didn't know there were so many South Asian and indigenous truck drivers. Like there's a ton of Sikhs who drove trucks. And, and I really enjoyed seeing their political commentary. I became friends with uh, one protester named Palminder Singh, who who's very you know you can he's got this beautiful golden turban and he so loves freedom and we've had him on the show before. I got to know Canadians from walks of life I had never would have got to know before. There were a ton of Quebecers because of course Ottawa is just across the river from Quebec, so a ton of Quebec drivers. It was and again it. It, this was heartening. I know if it was the other side's protest, they would they would be hamming up how diverse it was. And that's not the point. The point is they were there for freedom. We, there was a commonality. But I have to say, there, there were people from every background united by their love for freedom. It was one of the most pro-Canada, it was a warm, it was so bloody cold, but it was a warm feeling. And there was a feeling of brotherhood. And I know I'm sounding a little bit misty-eyed here, but that is honestly how it felt. And I wasn't in the center of it. I was at the periphery. I can only imagine what it was like to be at the hub of all these spokes. It was, it was beautiful. It was emotional. Uh, it was heavy. Um, you know, I, I, at the POEC in my testimony, I said, I have the 
tears of thousands of Canadians on my shoulder. And it's so true. I mean, the, the Facebook messages, the text messages that we received, every stop that we made, you know, people were hugging us and crying and thanking us and telling us their stories. And it, it definitely, I, I think I had a big heart before, but it, it definitely uh, made it swell. I just have so much compassion for these people. You know, we all suffered. That was two years of, of uh, tyranny. And you nailed it earlier. You know, it was so organic that people just got up off their couches in their communities. They didn't phone their friends and yeah. organize yeah. things. People just got off their couches, yeah. collected their families, walked out to the highway, and then saw all these people and thought, you know, they weren't alone or yeah. they weren't going crazy, you That's know? That's what it was. It was, they had felt alone for a few reasons. First of all, they were told to be alone. They were told, yes. don't go to church, don't go to synagogue, don't go to funerals or weddings, don't go to the gym, don't go to a restaurant, stay at home, six feet of separation, don't have Christmas dinner, don't have Thanksgiving. They, first of all, they made us feel alone. Then they forced us to get our information through the internet and TV, and there was a they enforced a unanimity there. So you felt alone, and who could you check with? Well, every single institution in society was repeating the official line. That's the independent nature of the truckers gave people proof that they were not going crazy. Like if you thought everyone else in the world was mad or you were mad, a rational person would say no, I'm crazy. The, if I'm the only guy in the world who thinks this way, it must be me who's nuts. No, turns out it was the system that was nuts. I don't know. I, I, I absolutely know what you mean. You gave, you and the truckers were visual proof that people were not alone. Hey, I got a question for you. And one of the things I thought was interesting in the book is how closely you and the other organizers worked with police the whole way across, like not just in Ottawa, where you were in regular contact, but all along the highways, like you say, you got a hundred kilometers worth of trucks coming. Well, you better talk to the highway patrol. You, they better be ready. And, and tell me about that because th to me, that shows two things. It shows the logistics, the planning, the organization, planning to make sure things go right, not just crossing your fingers. But it also shows that you were not rogues. In fact, once you got to Ottawa, there was this enormous effort, and the book describes this in great detail, to be compliant, to move away from residential areas, to, to clear lanes, to do things to stop antagonizing ordinary people, even though I think there were some professional complainers in Ottawa. I read the book and I thought, wow, if you were to believe the CBC, you would think that these were rioting, revolutionaries, Canada's January 6th uprising moment. But to read the book, there was really nothing you did that wasn't telegraphed in advance to police to ask their advice, to get their help, to put them at ease. Exactly. And that's why, you know, at the inquiry, I kept hearing people testify, well, we thought they were going to leave in two days. Like, where did you even get that from? <laughs> I I never said that on any lives. Do, like, I mean, who in their right mind thought we were going to travel for five days, stay for two and then come home? It, it's so crazy. But to, to your question, it was within just a few days after we started organizing and people, the support started coming in and the money, the donations started coming in. And I said to the captains, the road captains, I said, we need to start reaching out to all of our local RCMP or, or city municipal police, whatever, and start letting them know, you know, when we're going to be coming through. And so we decided that each road captain would be responsible for their own areas. So, so for example, while I wasn't a road captain, I mean, I, I obviously contacted the Red Cliff RCMP here and the Medicine Hat City Police to make sure that we could get through the city very safely. And everybody did that as, as we continued, the road captains all ended up with their own liaison officers to keep in contact with. So we had communications with police and law enforcement almost from the very beginning. Um, when we got into Manitoba, we were just supposed to have a, an escort by the OPP from the border of Manitoba to Kenora. And the gentleman that we were with was amazing and decided to escort us the whole way. So, I mean, the majority of the law enforcement that we dealt with were amazing. 
They were very helpful. They gave us a lot of really good advice. Uh, and I think in the long run, my personal opinion is if we could have dealt with the OPP through the duration of the convoy in Ottawa, instead of the extremely dysfunctional, as we learned at the POEC, uh, Ottawa City Police, this convoy would have had a different outcome. Yeah. Oh, it was incredible, the meltdown in the Ottawa police and their unprofessional conduct, just just absolutely shocking throughout their bullying. And then, of course, nothing takes the cake like Trudeau invoking martial law. He didn't invoke martial law during 9-11. He didn't invoke martial law when an al-Qaeda terrorist stormed parliament. But some honking horns and some parked trucks, uh, he panicked. And uh, I think he has a, I think he's spiteful and vengeful. And if you dare cross him, he will go to extreme lengths to teach you a lesson. And I think that was the real sin of the convoy. Is it embarrassed him? And we saw that in the Trucker Commission of Inquiry. Uh, we saw that he was embarrassed in the eyes, that the eyes of the world were on Canada. And he felt he looked like a meek, uh, fumbling, powerless fool. I think the reason he invoked martial law is because he was losing face. And mm. I don't know, I, I think it was an in, incredible moment. Let me ask you about the world. We've talked a bit about Canada and the Canadian media, but I think that the world for the first time looked at Canada and said, there is something very interesting here. Most of the time, I think people think Canada is a little bit boring or just uh, America light or something. But I think Tucker the, Carlson called us the great white west of the great white waste of time once or something like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, but Fox News, I mean, were, was uh, riveted by us, but so was many other media. You saw copycat trucker convoys everywhere from the Netherlands to Israel to Australia. Um, I think that people were excited and impressed. Tell me if you had any uh, international. Uh, stories that that you haven't shared before. Oh man, I not really specifically. I have gotten letters from all over the world, uh, lots from the states. I've got letters thanking me from the Netherlands, from Italy, Norway, uh, Scotland. It's unbelievable. We ne we could not have imagined that that would have went global like that, and. I remember when they came to us and said, you know, these convoys are starting all across the, you know, all over the world. And I, of course I cried because that's what I do now. Um, cause I, I, I just couldn't believe it. Like, you know, that Canada could have, or a movement that originated in Canada and you're right. I mean, we're known for being passive. I'll tell you one quick story on the way to Ottawa. We, we made a stop, a pit stop, and I walked into the women's washroom. And of course, there's a lineup and there's women everywhere standing. And all you could hear was, sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm, excuse me, sorry. And I and I said, this is the most Canadian bathroom I've ever been in. But that that is who we are, mm -hmm. you know. So I think to see something like this originate in Canada probably surprised a lot of people. But it it is a credit to our strength and to our resilience and to fundamentally who who we really are. I believe we are fairly passive. We don't like to make waves, but we also will stand up for ourselves if we get pushed too far. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that because I think it was atrocious that you were jailed. Uh, there are accused terrorists in this country who are allowed out on bail. You were in prison for almost 50 days. The bail restrictions on you not to use social media, not to do this, not to do they were clearly political. I think that you meet the test of a political prisoner. If there was a peaceful protester in Moscow who embarrassed Putin and was put in jail for 50 days, or a peaceful protester in Tehran, Iran, was jailed for 50 days, I think we would properly be outraged. I think you were a political prisoner and you actually have not had the substantive trial of the criminal charge against you. The fact that, yeah, I, I just think it's insane. I can't help but think that we have cabinet ministers, Pablo Rodriguez, drunk driver, uh, Stephen Gilbo, the environment minister, a convicted eco-terrorist, not, not just his stunt at the CN Tower, but he did a weird home invasion 
uh, of Ralph Klein's home when, when Ralph was away. It was just his wife, Colleen Klein. The, the most insane crimes. I mean, that's a crime. He's in the cabinet. You give peaceful protest advice to the truckers. You're jailed for 50 days and you haven't even had your day in court yet for the trial. I think that that is as much a banana republic move as seizing bank accounts and martial law. You still have your trial. What's, what's the latest on that? When, are, when is that criminal trial expected for you? Is that going to happen this year? Yes, I hope, uh, barring any delays. Uh, one thing I'm learning about the legal system, because we don't actually have a justice system in Canada, it is a legal system. The punishment is in the process and nothing nothing goes fast. And once you get caught in it, I mean, this is, I've never even been in Facebook jail before. Yeah. So this has been quite an eye-opening experience for me. And once you get caught in it, you're stuck there. I mean, there's nothing you can do. You just got to wait it out. Yeah. So our trial is scheduled to start on September the 5th. Chris Barber and I are co-accused and will mm -hmm. be tried together. Mm -hmm. uh, we just had court on Monday morning as the Crown prosecutor was hoping to switch judges. Um, she came back with a decision saying she was not going to be recusing herself and would remain as our trial judge, which we're very happy about. And um, hopefully everything sticks on the timelines. We have been in, a, in and out of court now for about the last six weeks on just a bunch of miscellaneous things, nonsense, basically. And um, so not, it's really frustrating to have all these hearings and, and not have like we still don't even know what we did. I mean, we're still waiting for the particulars, which really? for the Crown prosecutor to tell it's, us. It's been more than what a year. exactly we did. It's been more yeah, than a so, year. You haven't got full disclosure. That is yeah, we were supposed to have particulars on February 6th. 15th and 17th uh, that got changed into a different motion that the crown put forth so they've just rebooked our particulars hearing for july the 18th if you can believe that are you just about a year and a half later you know you were public enemy number one to trudeau and to this liberal partisan prosecutor the idea that they don't know the case against you that they don't have the details and the particulars is absurd they have unlimited resources and here we are a year plus into it, and they haven't, that is a disgrace. That is bringing the administration of justice into disrepute. We'll talk more another time about uh, how uh, we hope to help at the trial. I won't get into that now, but our viewers can guess what I'm thinking of because we do it a lot. But um, listen, I, I think that trial, it's a shame that it's, it, it shouldn't even happen. It's such a obvious political stitch up as they say and the prosecutor himself is out of control huge liberal donor uh vendetta abusive uh he, he's really a disgrace to the profession i i can't believe the crown has not replaced him with someone more even keeled but like i say trudeau never forgives um listen i want to end by telling our viewers that this book which I have read cover to cover, and I ordered my hard copy book. It's beautiful. It's, I learned so many things. There's a few chuckles in it. There's a few uh, humorous moments. There's some touching moments. Uh, there's some infuriating moments. It's a, it's a good read, and I think that is why it is the number one best-selling book in the country it was on the very first day we listed it, but I just see just today, Amazon called it the bestseller of the week as well, even beating out uh, Prince Harry's autobiography. So people want to know. And I think one of the reasons they want to know is because they sense that they've only been told either half the story or an incorrect story. And they know that by getting this book, they'll hear the other side of the story. I'm really excited about that. Last word to you. Me too. I, I hope everybody likes it. Uh, I, I think it's great. Again, I think it's going to answer a lot of questions and, and get let people get to know me a little bit better. I mean, that, that was always one of the things right from the start as the money started to come in last winter. You know, it was important to me that people got a sense of who I was. That's a huge responsibility. I mean, we raised $10 million that yeah. had like my name on it, you know, so it became really important to me that people got a sense of who, who I was. And um and I think this will help. And, yeah. and thank you all again so much for all your help, for helping me publish this book. I, I'm very pleased to, to get some truth out. 
Yeah, well, it's our pleasure. And you talk about that money at great length in the book and how it was frozen by the government and, and, and the battles to keep that money out of the hands of the government and how GoFundMe interfered. It's a fascinating part. And if anything, it shows the difference between our side and the other side is the other side is bought and paid for professional protesters, but our side, authentic, grassroots, organic, the million people or the hundreds of thousands of people that came out to see the truckers, no one paid them. The truckers, in the end, most of them didn't get any dough because the GoFundMe was re refunded and the Give, Send, Go was, you know, it, the government really tried. It, the fact that you succeeded despite having no, organ no formal organization of money was amazing. And the book details that. Folks, you can go to the website, theconvoybook.com. You can buy your copy there. You can also, if you want, chip in to help us with our guerrilla style marketing campaign for the book, which is coming along. And in fact, we're hiring a, uh, a marketer, producer, helper outer to get this, because I believe this book needs to be pushed because it's not going to be pulled by Chapters Indigo. I doubt they'll even put it on their shelves. We have to sell this book grassroots through word of mouth and we've got a plan to do that. And Tamara, I couldn't be prouder than to be uh, than to have Rebel News as the publisher of the book. I um, I think the convoy was the story of the year in 2022, and you were the leader of that story. And it's time your voice was heard. Congratulations, my friend, and uh, many more successes. May many more successes Thank come you. your way. Thank All you right. so much. Well, Thank it's you. Our pleasure. There you have it, Tamara Leach, the author of Hold the Line, available now, uh, the hardcover book, and of course, soon, the Kindle version and the audio book narrated by Tamara herself. That's our show for today. Until tomorrow, on behalf of all of us here at Rebel World Headquarters, to you at home, good night, and keep fighting for freedom. <music>